Hello and welcome back to the Endgame class. As always, my name is Caleb Denby, and today I am going to be walking you through um, some new updates on the corresponding squares lecture that I did a while ago. So the corresponding squares lecture that I did contained correct information, it was all factual, but I have been reading a pretty interesting book called The Complete uh, Comprehensive Chess Endings. Not complete, Comprehensive Chess Endings. And there is a very interesting chapter on corresponding squares written by Mikhail uh, Zarin, which is uh, opening my eyes a little bit to some new methods, some new ways of constructing corresponding squares. So the focus of the first lecture was uh, sort of understanding how corresponding squares, like what they are, how they work, right? White steps here, black steps here, and that's how it works. Uh, but what this chapter focused on in compre comprehensive chess endings was how can you actually generally figure out what type of corresponding squares you're dealing with? Like what the structure is, how can you just construct those squares given a position? And so that's what we're going to look at here today. And it's actually quite beautiful in most cases. Uh, generally, while there are a ton of positions that can be solved using corresponding squares, most of them uh, really fall into a couple different basic categories. And we're going to see how you start at a position, just not knowing anything about it, and the steps you take to figure out for any position where the corresponding squares are, how to make the corresponding squares. So let's jump into it here. I have a study up on the screen that can be solved using corresponding squares. Uh, in the study, it is white to move, and to actually win this position is the goal. So what do we have here? Well, we have uh, a lot of the squares being blocked, right? White can't get through on any of these squares, right? They're all blocked off. Mm -mm. All of these squares are blocked. Notably, there are two holes in this great wall uh, that could be exploited by white. Hole number one is this square on d6, right? White could break through onto d6 and start targeting the black pawns. Hole number two is quite obviously on f4, where white would have a similar idea to break through and start targeting the pawns. So the first step in any uh, king and pawn end game study is to try and figure out some key squares. And now key squares are what are, they're sort of the first step in the process to lead us to creating our corresponding squares. So this is the same as the first lecture. We just need to figure out what are the key squares. First of all, what are key squares? Well, key squares uh, are any square that if your king arrives at that square unimpeded, then you win the game. They're sort of your, your goal. You get to a key square, and the game's over. You know you've won. You have a winning position. It's easy to win. So let's try and find some squares like that in this position to start off with. Does anybody in the chat know any of the key squares? One minute cliff notes? Yes, so that's basically the one minute cliff notes is, well, we'll, we'll get back into it for, for this lecture. But yeah. So the key squares. And yeah, Great Wolf said f4, d6, maybe key squares. And that's sort of what it looks like intuitively, right? You know, these squares are sort of matching. They both target pawns. It turns out, though, d6 is a great key square, right? Uh, and how you can figure this out is you imagine your king on d6. It looks intuitively like it might be a key square. To determine if it actually is, you say to yourself, can I put the enemy king any on any reasonable square on the board? and still be winning? And the answer is yes, right? We're attacking this pawn. The only square that black could defend the pawn from is f7. But if the king's on f7, then we still win because we can play king d7. So that makes d6 a key square. It's a square. If we get our king to it, we are absolutely winning 100% of the time. Now, is f4 a key square? And it turns out the answer to that is no. Why is the answer no? Who knows? <laughs> 
Who knows why f4 isn't a great square, or a key square, sorry. So yeah, if the enemy king was on the perfectly reasonable square of h5, and it was white's turn, then we would have no better move than to move away. So we don't win if we get to f4, because if the enemy king's on h5, then we have nothing better but retreating. But g5, of course, does not have that problem. If we get our king to g5, we win the game. OK? And now here's we're gonna, where we're going to start to defer from the previous lecture. In the previous lecture, we started just trying to create corresponding squares here. And yeah, that's a, that's a perfectly legitimate way of doing it. And in fact, I think Dvoretsky recommends you do it by trying to find what's called mind squares, M-I-N-E-D, mind squares. They're like landmines. If you step on this square, then you get blown up. But there, I think, is a better system uh, described in comprehensive chess endings. And that system is to first determine the shortest path between these two squares for both sides. And so I'll give you white's shortest path, and then I'll ask you guys to give me black's. So the shortest path between these two squares for the kings is, well, we can't step here or here, but we can step here. And then we can go directly between the two, right? So we have, here, I'll use a different color other than blue. We have this shortest path, right, that's four squares long. So using this idea, can you guys tell me black's shortest path and all of the squares that we should include on that path? Great Wolf asks, f6 is a key square too, isn't it? So yes, we would always win by getting to f6. Thank you for, for mentioning this, by the way. But we don't need to count it as a key square. Because if we got to f6, then we would have had to pass through the key square g5 first, or the key square d6 first. So it's not very relevant to us, because we can't get there unless we were previously on a square that we already knew to be key. Why is g5 a key square and not g4? You make a good point. g4 would also be a key square. In fact, g4 is maybe uh, a better way of putting it as, as a key square. But We'll highlight both of them. For our purposes, it doesn't really matter, because the only square to get to, get to either of these squares is still, uh, well, colors are hard, is still f4. We'll highlight both. So yeah, there are some ideas here. And yeah, it's a little bit confusing to actually try to read in the chat. OK, so everybody agrees g6 is one of the squares for black. Let's go red again. Um, and actually, h5 is a square that I don't think anybody has mentioned, right? You need to be able to step to h5 to counteract the white king stepping to, h, to f4, right? Otherwise, white gets to g4. And so yeah, thank you, the person in chat who corrected me. g4 is an important key square because black must step to h5 when white steps to f4 in order to control g4. Good point. Uh, okay. Other than that, we can intuitively find the square g6, and then the square f7, and then the square e7, right? And once again, we have a path that is uh, four steps long. OK, and let me double check myself here, because this does get rather confusing. Four steps long, everybody agrees. Let me get rid of these silly arrows. Oh, god, it's all falling apart. I should have practiced more with the arrow colors. It's too tough. Too tough. So we have now the key squares outlined and the shortest paths. And I'm now actually going to get rid of the key squares. Because what really matters is this path. We just found this path by use of highlighting those, those key squares. And now notably, the square g5 is not actually on black's shortest path. The reason for that is it takes uh, one, two, three, four, four steps to get there from h5, whereas it only takes three steps to get to e7 if we go directly through g6. So g5 doesn't quite count. So what do we have here? We have the shortest path. Great. Job done, mission accomplished. Next study. Uh, of course, not quite. So how does this tell us what the corresponding squares are going to be. Well, actually, it turns out 
as the title states, it's a beautiful bit of geometry to be found in these chess endgames. And so you can pretty much always determine what sort of system for the corresponding squares is going to be used by the shape of this shortest path. In this case, the first shape we're going to look at is the shape that we see in this puzzle. And that shape is uh, triangles. We see right here on d4 and e3, these squares are connected by the square d3. And they form a little mini triangle. Everybody sees this. And the corresponding squares, g6, f7, are connected by g7. And once again, we have our little mini triangle. Right? Everybody loves triangles. And it turns out this is sort of the strictest pattern. So what does that mean? That means this is the one we should look for first because it affords both sides the least options uh, to go wrong. And the reason for that uh, will be known a little bit later. But that's the reason why we don't actually choose this triangle to make our corresponding squares. Because if we did choose this triangle, then black squares would actually be adjacent to each other. And that allows black a little bit more freedom. How does that allow black more freedom? Well, white only has the one square to choose from to get to both of these squares. In the meanwhile, black would actually have two squares to choose from that could step to these squares. And so we don't want to pick this triangle because it affords black more options, right? It's not quite as clear what the corresponding squares are because there's this ambiguity between e8 and f8. Nobody knows. Uh, if both of these correspond to c4, or if or only one of them does. It's not quite immediately clear, which is why we pick this triangle instead in blue, because for both sides, there's only the one square connecting them. And that's as sort of strict as least, uh, the least ambiguous you can get. So we pick this one to get our corresponding squares. And this is, like I said, known as the triangle system. And it's actually more clearly stated as the eight square triangle system in comprehensive chess endings. How is the eight square triangle system? Well, whenever you get this pattern, the corresponding squares are very predictably created in an eight square manner. Uh, and that's, in fact, going to be the case for all the systems of corresponding squares we look at here. They're all going to be created in a very predictable manner. And so if you remember this system where you take the shortest path, you look for the shapes. And from the shapes, you make your corresponding squares. It's always going to follow the predictable system that we learn here today. So system number one to look for is this one, the eight square triangle system. It occurs when two squares on the shortest path are linked diagonally and are connected by just one central square. OK? Does that make sense? Before I move on to show you the system of the actual corresponding squares, does everybody understand how we got here? This is the first thing to look for. If both sides have two corresponding squares linked diagonally that are connected by the one square sort of in between them, creating a triangle, that's the pattern to go for. What happens if that doesn't exist? Well, we're going to learn the other patterns next. But does everybody understand this, how we got here? Lots of words says barely anything. Well, I'm trying to be sort of repetitive and to say it in different ways slightly so that everybody sort of gets what's happening. OK, everybody gets it. Wonderful. So then what is this system of corresponding squares that I keep talking about? Well, it turns out they are numbered uh, pretty simply. right? We'll call this square 1. We could really call it any, anything. This square corresponds to this square. So we have square number 1. We'll call the other diagonal square, square number two. And we'll call the square that links them square number three. So they're linked in this manner. One corresponds to one, two to two, three to three. And from there, you build out to the surrounding eight squares. Sorry, not surrounding eight squares, the surrounding five squares, making eight squares total. OK? So you can start here. We'll just call this number four. I'll make it green. 
And I'm actually going to get rid of these squares that are on the shortest path for a moment. So we build out. That one is green. The corresponding square is uh, built on these surrounding five squares. So we'll call this one number four for black. We have, of course, predictably, number five for white on C3. Note that I ran out of colors. So these two squares, C3 and E3, are not identical. They are different. But there's just not that many colors on Lee Chess. So the corresponding square is, of course, G8. Then we have uh, C2 for white, H8 for black. And I'm actually going to make this red to try and make it a little bit less confusing that don't worry, I'm, I'm just going to make it red. We have d2, and we have h7, and we have e2, and h6. And it turns out this pattern is always going to be true when you have this shape. We started with our initial shape, and now we have this pattern. This pattern of corresponding squares just is. It just always exists. And what do you do if there isn't enough space to draw out this circle of eight squares? Well, then it turns out you can't actually use this pattern. You should try to make the pattern somewhere else or try to make a different pattern. And that's why this system is the first we should look for, but isn't always the most common or the most useful, because it requires so much space to actually create, because it is so strict with the corresponding squares. Um, so you won't always see this pattern. In fact, most of the time, you're going to see the next pattern that we look at. But it's important to start here, because this is the first one you should look for. If you can make this one, you should and have to make this pattern. Now, of course, this doesn't yet help us, right? Our king's over here. Our king's over here. What are we supposed to do with this with our king over here? Well, it turns out that this pattern can actually be extended further down the board. And you can extend it. Uh, across sort of the entire board as long as black doesn't have any meaningful counterplay. What does that mean? Well, for example, if our king were over on you what, like negative e, you know, negative 5, then in this position it wouldn't matter. But in some positions, like let's say black could get through on the f5 square, if our king's far enough away, then the black king can sort of invade and create threats of his own. That's not the case here, because the black has no method of entry, which means we can extend it using this pattern. Uh, horizontally, the squares sort of skip over each other. So d4 actually corresponds to b4 in this case. So now, despite me saying, you know, none of these squares are actually related to each other, I just rounded the colors, b4 is in fact directly related to d4. These two are linked. Uh, in the meantime, b3 is linked to d3. These two squares are the same. So what does that mean? Well, that means uh, d4, we said, is linked to f7. That also means b4 is linked to f7. And same thing with d3. d3, g7, and b3, g7 are also linked. We can also do this with this green square here. Uh, those squares are linked, and vertically, it's the same pattern. It just extends out, skipping over a square. And so we can make this pattern here. Very, very beautiful, right? Uh, and now, going even further, the idea still persists. You just extend out the squares. So we have green going out here. So that means C4, which corresponds with F8 also corresponds with a4. So a4, f8, c4, f8, it's all the same. Blue goes to a3. And so c3 was corresponding to g8. It also corresponds to a3. This red square also extends out. So c2, which is h8, also score corresponds to a2. And so on and so forth, right? So on and so forth. Uh, King b1 would also correspond to b1. You can extend like this or like this. It doesn't really matter. And so now we can start to solve the puzzle from here. We extended the pattern out. And from here, it should hopefully be apparent what the solution is. So let me get rid of some of these confusing arrows. They were just to show you which squares were linked to each other. And who sees the solution? 
now that I'm getting rid of the confusing arrows. Who sees the solution? Yeah, king a2 is the first move. Why is that apparent? Well, we see that c2 corresponds to h8, right? And extending our pattern, we saw that a2 is the same as c2, right? So a2 also corresponds to h8, which means if we step to a2, our opponent is already on h8, so he cannot step to h8, which means we win the game. Uh, it's the same idea as if the kings were on f4 and h5, right? If our opponent's king is on h5 and we step to f4, he has to move away and we win the game. It's just an extension of that process, OK? And we built it from these two squares on the shortest path. You can use any squares on the shortest path and create this type of pattern from them. So now, just to demonstrate, I'm going to put my reputation on the line and continue from here with the computer. No, wait, I can't do this. Ben will get mad at me. We'll just play it on the board here. So king a2. Now we'll just do it on the board. We'll do king a2, right? And now somebody in the chat throw out a random move, OK? I'm going to pretend I read the move king g8. King g8, right? So how do we step? Uh, how do we know which square to step to here? Well, let's think, right? We had our triangle like this. Black's triangle was like this, right? It's a little bit harder without you know all the drawings on the board, but we can still manage, right? So where did Black step to? Black stepped to g8, which corresponds to this square in our box, right? You know. D4 is F7, C4 is F8, C3 is G8. So where do we step to now? Well, we step, of course, to A3, because we can extend out our pattern this far. Uh, OK, so let's say now black steps to uh, G, G7, we'll say. Black steps to G7. Where should we step to now? Well, let's just try to visualize it this time. I'm not going to draw the circles. We have our square here, right? And black's square here. Black is on the center part of his square. Our center part is d3. We can extend it out to b3, so king b3. Now let's say king f7, right? And OK, so we have uh, our, our little square here. He has his little square here. He's on f7, which corresponds to d4. So where can I step to now? Well, turns out. I can step in a couple different directions. But uh, this is where it gets a little tricky. OK? I know it's been so simple so far. But here's where it gets a little tricky, right? From this part of a square, black cannot access the corner square. And our corner square is c2. So whenever possible, it's true that moves like king b4 would win the position as well. It would just take longer. But whenever possible, you should always step closer to your shortest path. And so king c2 is the best way to step closer to the shortest path. You want to get into that main square of eights, and from there, get to one of those two key squares. Uh, now, it's pretty smooth sailing from here. Let's say black plays something ridiculous, like king e8. Right? All of a sudden, we're in our square, and black is not. Right? So all you have to do now is envision, well, which of these squares that I can get to can my opponent not get to? Turns out he can't get to his center square anymore. And so from here, we can win the game. Let's say king f7 now requires a little bit of nuance. He has his square. We have our square. f7 is d4. So which square can't he step to? Well, he could actually step to this square if we step to e3. But thankfully, we are a bit smarter than that. And we can step to the square he's currently standing on, which is on the shortest path. And now it is just the easiest position in the world to win. Why is that? Well, it's because since we're on the shortest path, if you remember, which looks like this, black now has to make a decision. He either steps to the left on the shortest path or he steps to the right on the shortest path. 
and we can go whichever direction black doesn't go. So king e7 would mean king e3, and we win. Or king g7 or g6 would mean king c5, and we win. Just that easy. Isn't king c2 also linked with f8? So no. Let's step back to our initial position here and ignore those squares. Focus on the main square here. So these eight squares are all unique. Remember, I can only draw them in four colors because that's all the colors I have. But these are all unique. It's an eight square system. So there are eight unique squares. One, two, three, and then four, five, six, seven, eight. All eight unique squares. So none of these squares correspond to any other squares in this eight square system. Uh, OK, so what does that mean? That means this square only corresponds to this one. This square only corresponds to this one. Yellow only to yellow. This one only here. Right? There's no other uh, squares that they correspond to in this eight square system. Now. This extends outwards past the eight squares, but in those eight squares, those are the only things. OK, does that make sense? Mm -mm -mm. Does that make sense? Feels like 4D geometry. It's very beautiful stuff, right? Very beautiful stuff. So OK, once again, we started with our shortest path for both sides between the key squares of g4 and d6, right? the shortest path between those two for both sides. From there, we noticed this triangle pattern. This is the first pattern we should look for, where we construct an eight square system. OK? That's step number two. We found this linking square. Then we decided to say that these eight squares are linked as such. And then we realized we can extend the pattern out in this manner. Sorry, this extends here, this extends here, right? And we can extend it all the way to the edge of the board. And that's how we discovered king a2 is the winning move. What does it mean that the squares are linked? At its basic level, are you not just shrinking the board? Maybe, I don't know. I don't think so, but maybe. <laughs> um, so what does it mean that they're linked? So in its most basic form, let's show these the shortest path again. These are our first corresponding squares that are very easy to determine because they're the shortest path between the key squares. Corresponding and linked mean the same thing. So if white steps to f4, black must step to f5. right? If white steps to e3, black must step to g6. If white steps to d4, black must step to f7. Otherwise, black loses the game. And so we built these linked squares outwards until we discovered which square can we step to where black can't step to a linked square? And that square would allow us a path to victory, no matter what black does. OK. Isn't the shortest path enough to remember how to play this? So yeah, that's what the idea is. The idea is what we learned tonight is going to allow us to solve any position by just finding the shortest path. So this is just one of the many patterns, OK? One of the many patterns is this triangle system here. But sometimes we'll see you can't always form the triangle system. So let's move on to another example now. And hopefully things will start getting a little bit more clear. All right, here we have a very, very, very similar position. g4 is still a key square. d6 is still a key square. What's the shortest path between them? I'm just going to tell you guys, it's this to here to here to here, right? Everybody sees this is the shortest path to get between the two key squares. And black's path is going to be the same as last time as well. All right. What is the difference? Well, the difference is we put a pawn on f2 and a pawn on f3. So what that means is that we cannot quite form our eight square system. Why is that? Well, it's because one of our squares in our eight square system is defended. And that just blows the whole thing up. All right, just blows it right up. No longer works. We're busted. Can't do it anymore. We just can't do it anymore. I'm sorry. 
We can't. I know you want to, but we can't do it. So what can we do? Well, now we can go to what I think is probably the most common system that is formed by the shortest path, the most common pattern, which is called the quadratic system in comprehensive chess endings. And I think it's a good enough, good enough name. So how can you form the quadratic system? Well, there are two patterns you can form it from. Okay, This is pattern number one. And pattern number one is when you have this triangle system together, but you can't use all eight squares. So all that's required for this pattern to work is that you have the ability to make a 2 by 2 square uh, behind one base of the triangle. Does that make sense? A 2 by 2 square behind one base of the triangle. So here's our triangle, right? We have a base down here, but we cannot form a 2 by 2 square because this base or this, this square is uh, defended. But on this other base of the triangle, we very much can form a 2 by 2 square. OK? And this 2 by 2 square is the basis of our entire pattern for this system, the quadratic system, the 2 by 2 pattern. So once again, we can use this pattern because we have these two, two squares, which are diagonally connected and are linked by this one square in the middle. And then one of the bases of this triangle has these two spaces behind it, so we can form a 2 by 2 square behind one base of the triangle. We would not be able to do this in the previous puzzle because we could make the more strict 8 square system of this. Cannot do it here because this square is defended. So we fall back on this quadratic system. Does that make sense? Steve, I will show something like that in this puzzle. I don't want to jump back and forth too much, but that, that is a good question. Why g4 and not f4? How do you decide? So it's the same key squares as the last puzzle, uh, which when we were deciding those key squares, I said f4 appears to be a key square. But to be a true key square, it has to be a square where you are completely winning uh, regardless of where you put the enemy king, within reason, obviously. Regardless of where you put the enemy king, on any reasonable square it could get to. So on f4, if the enemy king is on h5, you don't win, because your king would have to retreat. However, if your king is on g4, doesn't matter where you put the enemy king, you're going to win. You take f3 next, you push your g-pawn. Easy win. <clears throat> It supersedes it, King Lorpide. You have to use the eight square system, if possible. Otherwise, this stuff doesn't work. You'll get messed up. Uh, OK, so in this case, though, eight square system failed us. Garbage doesn't work. So two by two system, which is, like I said, slightly, well, I think significantly more common. So let's build it. How does it work? Well, let's get rid of these extraneous squares and focus on the key squares, not, sorry, not the key squares, the important squares to our pattern, which are d4, e3, and g6, f7, these corresponding squares, right? This is how we'll make the pattern for both sides here. Uh, so like I said, the important thing to start with is this linking square between the two. And I keep using difficult terms. This square between the two that connects to both of them and so that, of course, will correspond to g7 as well. And now we have these two squares that form the rest of our what's called the main zone in comprehensive chess endings. That's their term for it. The main part of our pattern from which we can extend out. And it's these two squares that are left. So we have c4 and c3. And now, depending on the position, sometimes these squares are distinct, and sometimes they are not. Sometimes they serve the same function. So of course, for black, we're on the side closer to d6. So black must also be on the side closer to d6. This side, of course, closer to the g4, which would correspond to this side. We're on this side closer to d6. Um, for black, those are these squares. And believe it or not, 
we can even get rid of those, those two. From these, four keys, from these four corresponding squares, you can build out the rest of the pattern. It's just that easy with the quadratic system. You have a two by two little setup here. And then from that, it's the rest of the pattern is obvious. And it actually extends the exact same way as the eight square system. D4 extends out to D2, D3 to D1, so on and so forth. And this time, I actually do have enough colors. So the colors I'm putting here actually mean all these squares are essentially identical. OK? So all those squares just extend out. And it's as easy as that. So chat room, what's the correct answer here with this knowledge? What's the correct answer? From which book? Yes, Comprehensive Chess Endings, the series with uh, that Averbach is the author for most of it. But uh, the chapter on uh, corresponding squares, I believe, was actually written by Mikhail Zarin. So yeah, of course, it's king b2, because h7 is the extension of f7. And so we go king b2, right? We go king b2. And now my question is, what if he steps to g7? Can you guys figure out the corresponding square to g7 without the circles on the board? And I'll just remind you briefly, we have these four squares for white and these four squares for black. These are the important ones. These four squares for white, these four squares for black. Can you figure it out? This has a lot to do with distant opposition. I think that's sort of getting it backwards, uh, Karenth. I think distant opposition has its roots in corresponding squares rather than the other way around. Uh, I think the best way I've heard it phrased is that uh, positions where there's distant opposition is sort of a, spe a specific instance of corresponding squares sort of linking together. So yeah, of course, it is king b3. How do we know that? Well, let's highlight our four squares here. And I'm no longer going to use colors as a shortcut. We have d4, which of course corresponds to f7, d3, g7, c3, g8, c4, f8. And so he stepped to g7, corresponding to d3. We extend d3 out this way. And king b3 is the direct answer. King b8 now, or sorry, king g8 is likely the best try. I take it back. King f7 is likely the most confusing try now for white. We have these four squares. King f7 corresponds to king d4. So where should white step? Of course, he should step to the extension of d4 on b4. Now let's say king back to g8. This is stepping too far away now from the shortest path when white would win. So if king f8, keeping an eye on e7, now, of course, the corresponding square to f8, d4, f7, c4, f8. We step here, king f7, king d4. And once again, we find ourselves on the shortest path, and black has to make a move. We just inched our way towards the shortest path, always stepping to the corresponding squares. And now black is once again in Zugzwang choosing either between the left side of the board in the d6, the d6 square or the right side of the board in the g4 square. Let's say king g6. We go this way, winning the game. Let's say king g7, same issue. King f8, now we go this way, winning the game. OK. Uh, as far as the question of I think this was somebody's question in the chat about the last, the last puzzle. What happens if black just sort of makes a beeline for the shortest path? How does he ever lose this game? Well, the fact is, now that you're on the shortest path, if you start choosing between squares, white is able to get to, to one of the key squares, right? He's, white is keeping his options open between which square on the shortest path he picks. And he can sort of uh, juke you out, right? You go one way, he goes the other. And so hopefully that's a little bit more apparent here. Any questions? Any questions on this one? 
<laughs> Didn't I say c2 wins instead of b4, or is it different in that case? So let's play a move. So king b3, king g7. So here we have our four squares and our four squares. Uh, g7 corresponds to d2. And OK. No, sorry. I did this backwards. So king b2, king g7, yeah, king b3. So why doesn't king c2 win here? Well, because it extends out uh, orthogonally, not, not diagonally like this. So these four squares are our distinct squares in this case. And extending it out, it's actually c4 that uh, is connected to c2, not, B, not d3. So c4 corresponds to f8. So that means that after king c2, black can step to f8. And he's on the corresponding square. And now all of a sudden, the position is drawn. No way to break through for white. We get boxed. See, we're on the shortest path, but now it's our turn to move. And we're, it will always be our turn to move now, because black can maneuver on the corresponding squares. Is it a draw if you go to the wrong square? That's correct. That's correct. If it was black to move first, what would be the outcome? That's a good question. Let's get the position with black to move. Black to move here. And actually, it is black to move and draw. So how can we figure that out? We have our four squares. We have our extension of the pattern. C4 goes to C2, C2, A2, or like this. So black merely needs to step to the corresponding square on his half of the board. In this case, f8 corresponds to c4. And so king h8 draws the game. Believe it or not. OK, so that's what we have here. That's this study. Hopefully, you guys have a good grasp on that. If not, hopefully, giving it a rewatch will allow you to fully understand it. So now, in this example, all four of these squares were distinct corresponding squares, and then we extended the pattern out. But it does turn out that that is not always uh, the case. And when that is not the case is when you have the very interesting case of uh, these two squares being equidistant from the shortest path in all cases. In this case, they're not equidistant. c4 is one step away from c5, whereas c3 is two steps away from c5. So you see, they are unique squares here. Uh, and we're going to do one more where they are unique squares, and then hopefully we'll get to one where they are not. So let's do one more. This is an end game study as well. And I'm going to skip sort of that first part. Uh, so I'm going to go through this first part pretty quickly. We need the key squares. What are the key squares? Well, it turns out if white gets to f6 or g6, he absolutely always wins the game. If he gets to b6 or c6, he also always wins the game, as well as a6. So we have our key squares here. So what's our shortest path between the key squares? Well, we have this square for white. These two are actually identical, because they can both step to c3. And here, right? And now a5 and g5 are actually also going to be unique squares here. The reason being, g5 threatens to step to closer to the queen side, as well as to these squares, OK? So this is our shortest path for white. Black's shortest path is a little bit easier to see. OK? This is black's shortest path. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six steps. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six steps. Sorry, a7 is also important. Uh, the reason being, Uh, if white steps to a5, black is not good enough on b7, because from b7, white could go king b5 and then invade a key square. So this is what we have here. right? This is our shortest path for both sides. And now you notice the, a pretty distinct difference from last time is we have this ambiguity here. 
We have these ambiguous squares in the center. And so, hate these squares. Hate when there's ambiguity. Why is there ambiguity? Well, because white could, black could step to e8, and then back to d7, and then back to c8, and still get to b7 in the same number of steps as if he just went directly across the seventh rank. So it turns out these squares are ambiguous. It doesn't matter where black steps, as long as he's stepping on one of them. So to form a pattern, we cannot use those slightly ambiguous squares, which means we're not happy with these central squares for forming patterns. We don't like them. We just don't like it, OK? What we do see is on the end, we have two adjacent squares. And this is, in fact, sort of a shortcut from the base of the triangle that we found in the last study. So once again, I'm going to jump back really quickly. In the last study, we formed our triangle from this base. Sorry, we formed our 2 by 2 square from the base of this triangle, which had space behind it. So now, rather than a triangle, we just use these two adjacent squares for either side. OK? And then works exactly the same. We build our four out behind it. And those are our four squares. OK? So now, I'm going to ask you guys at home, using these four squares, can you extend the pattern in your head to find white to move and win this position? Why, F8, uh, why not f8 for black? Uh, because, sorry, on the shortest path, if white is on f5, it's not enough for black to be on f8. He needs to be on f7. Does that make sense? Black's on f8, then white can invade. Because it's touching the key squares. Yeah, everybody's already got it. King g1. Now, hard mode here. King f7. White to move and win. White to move and win. You don't even get those initial four squares now. You've got to remember them all. King g1 was great. King g1 was great. So this is the tough one now. This is the tough one. And yeah, you guys have the right idea. Of course, not king g2, because from our pattern, we know that king g2 corresponds to king g8 when we have a drawn position. But rather, king f1 is winning the game. And now the really tricky bits, king e7, white to move and win. This is sort of the, the final hard move to find. Well, the corresponding squares here, chess king, after king e7, become very important. Chess king says king e1. We have, oh, yes. So it turns out this is the difficult move to find. So king e1, king g2, king e1, king e2, king e1, king e2. And yeah, it turns out not king e2. King e2 could, of course, be met by, let's figure it out. We have our squares here. Uh, which square is e2? e2 corresponds to g4, which corresponds to g8. g8 extends out to e8. King e8, drawn position. But king g2, and now it turns out, even though king e8 would be stepping to the quote unquote corresponding square here, the difference now is that at the end of the day, stepping, of course, to these squares, king g4, King g8, black cannot actually ever make it back over to the g file. And after king g5, king f7, king f5, white wins the game. So the correct answer is king g1, king f7, king f1, king e7, king g2, when black cannot step to the corresponding square on g8. Okay? And then 
if black steps back to f8, white to move and win. Of course, we don't step up. We step to f2, staying on the corresponding square. Right? Uh, king back to e7. Now we can step up. King f7, king f3. And sorry, not king there. King, uh, let's say king f8. We would have to go king f4. And we win the game. Right? Uh, and now the hard part of this puzzle is realizing that we are actually in time to stop black from going this way. And what happens if uh, black tries to step over to the king side? Well, now we can actually go this way. And black is, is busted. So we started with these four corresponding squares, and we extend them all the way down the board. And that's how we find king g1, king f1, king g2, which is very mysterious to the naked eye, but makes a lot of sense when you figure out this system of corresponding squares. OK. Does king e1 there draw? Uh, let's find out. King e1, I believe, should draw. Uh, this one is going to be a lot less intuitive. I think king e8 is the drawing move. And the point now is if you step to e2, king e7. Uh, and the reason for all of this is, ah, uh, yes, the reason is these two squares were identical on black's shortest path. He can get to any of the important squares he needs to get to from either of those squares. So once again, distant opposition, not enough to tell you the answer there. Uh, it's not intuitive that e8 and e7 are the same square for black. In, in all useful sense of the word, e7 and e8 are the same square. So king e8, and if you start coming this way, king f8 is the corresponding square. Come up the board, not going to be enough. Not going to be enough. Even king f8 here. Um, OK. Let's do one more really, really quick. And we'll figure it out here. So I mentioned this a little bit earlier on about uh, sometimes the two rear squares behind the, uh, behind the squares on the shortest path are sometimes counted as the same when their distance to the shortest path is identical, when they are equidistant. So let's really quickly work this one out here. We have, once again, our shortest path on the board for both sides, because d5 and h6, or sorry, and h6, g6 are all key squares. OK, just trust me on that one. We didn't have time to, for me to ask you guys on that one. This is sort of our key squares and our shortest path. Uh, and so from here, where can we build um, our glorious uh, base? Well, we can do it here, right? We can build our little 2 by 2 section. Notably, we cannot use the 8 square method because this square is defended by black. So we go back to the quadratic method. And the quadratic method tells us that these four squares are important. Right? For black, it's this square and these squares. Those are the corresponding squares. Now, why are the two squares not unique here? Well, like I said, it's because their distance to the shortest path is equal. They're equidistant. What does that mean? That means it takes two turns to get to g4 from f2, but it also takes two turns to get to g4 from e2. Similarly, it just takes one turn to get to f3 from either square. And so it takes two turns to get to e4 from either square as well, meaning they are equidistant to the shortest path on both sides. And because of that, they are uh, only counted as sort of a, a unit. They correspond to the same squares. And they are sort of intercha interchangeable. Uh, so what does that mean for our pattern? Well, it means that this is also going to be uh, one of those squares, because it threatens to step to those two. And so that means 
that black is also sort of stuck in this position here. So of course, the winning move here is king d2, when black is now split between covering the corresponding square to e3, which is, of course, d7, and from covering um, the key, this square on the shortest path, and from covering this square, which allows white to choose between the three, right? So if black could move super far, he would put this king on d8 and easily draw the game here. But he can't move the king super far, so he has to choose one. King d7 is the best try. When let's figure this out now. These are our four squares. Where can we step to to win the game now? Well, we want to force black to choose between one of these two so we can step to the other one. So king d3 is the answer. Now if king c6, you get met with not king e4, sorry, but of course these four squares. The one that black abandoned was king e2, so this wins the game. Now king back, we can step king f3. If king over, we can step king e3. e3 corresponding to d7. Now king here, white goes here. And finally, black has to choose between, uh, between the shortest paths, if that makes sense. Sorry, I super rushed through that last one to show an example of where the uh, back two squares of the two by two uh, quadratic square that we make were sort of treated as the same. So that one might have not made the most sense as I went through it pretty quickly. But hopefully you guys are starting to get a feel for these corresponding square positions. I think I'll probably do a follow-up lecture uh, to go over, number one, this idea in more detail, and number two, uh, a couple more of the potential type of scenarios that you can get. Almost all of them are based on either this eight-square system or this quadratic system, or a third one, which is called the triangle system, or some combination of those three. And really, that triangle system is very, very rare. So we'll talk a little bit more about this next week, but hopefully you guys have a really good start now on this sort of geometrical way of creating corresponding squares in positions. I know it's really complex stuff, and it's not a lot of you know, just general chess ideas, but it is a lot of sort of this almost math problem-like feeling to them. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed. That is it for us here on the YouTube channel tonight. We will be doing Analyze Your Games live on Twitch directly after this, so be sure to check it out. Other than that, my name is Caleb Denby. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time.